Um, so we're, boom, already on the fourth lecture. Um, we're going to try to do a couple things today. Uh, this lecture is going to cover the block equations and relaxation. I asked you to do something a little bit different. I hope you guys followed through. Uh, last year's lecture was online. Hopefully you watched it or most of it or all of it or maybe you watched it more than once, right? It's amazing. Um, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to step through some of that material. I'm going to dive back into some of the stuff from last week, or sorry, from Tuesday as well, because we didn't get through everything that I wanted to. Um, and then uh, I don't think it'll take us the whole time to go through the material. And then I want to spend some more time talking about homework and homework problems and questions on the website and this kind of stuff. So that's kind of just where we're headed for that. Um, so there's been a couple questions about the website, a couple questions about the homework. And let's go ahead and ask all the questions you need to and want to about that. Uh, just sort of toward the end. If things go as planned, we'll wrap up a little bit on the early side because, again, there's already this material that's uh, available at um, So what I want to go back to is just a quick review of what we sort of did last time, just kind of a recap of where we were for the V1 system. Uh, we'll, we'll wrap up a little bit of material from that lecture, and then we'll get into talking about relaxation more. Um, these are the movies that didn't work last time, so sorry for that, but I think they're instructive. Uh, if you don't have a sort of a, in your head yet a picture of what's happening in the laboratory frame versus what's happening in the rotating frame, um, what you just saw was the movie uh, here. This is excitation due to the P1 pulse, right? But you're seeing two things happening, right? You're seeing precession because of the external V0 field, and you're also seeing this orange vector, the bulk magnetization, lying down, right? So for, and we'll do a couple of these today, what's the flip angle for that, uh, for that vector? 90, right? It started straight up and it tipped down 90 degrees. A little trickier, what axis is it phased around? What's the phase for that arm pulse? If we just name it in terms of the x, y axes. Minus y, right? So it's a left-hand uh, mutation. Uh, B fields cause left-hand rotations of the bulk magnetization. There's a minus sign in front of everything. And so here, if I put my uh, if I use the left-hand rule, put my thumb along the minus y-axis, then I can see it would lie down along the x-axis. We'll go through another. We'll go through uh, two or three more examples of that later in the lecture. So that's what's happening in the rotating frame. Not actually all that complicated, but for the most part, we don't care about this processional behavior. The processional behavior is important to us because that's how we detect a signal in the coil. It's Faraday's law of induction. Um, but we don't otherwise really care about it. What we really care about is we'll see some in this class in the next couple of lectures is what's happening to sort of the magnitude of this bulk magnetization vector as a consequence of relaxation. So what we did last time is we went through some mathematical rigmarole. In fact, we skipped some of it just to get to the, to the end point. Uh, but we wanted to sh I wanted to show you what happens in the so-called rotating frame. So in the rotating frame, the, the, uh, the action of the V1 pulse on the bulk magnetization is just a little bit simpler, right? So here you can see it more easily as just being a 90 degree in the absence, or because we've demodulated, if you will, the precession of the behavior. And then we've made a change of rotation, right? So we go into the rotating frame, uh, then we refer to the axes as the x prime, y prime, and z prime axes. Um, you know, as, as with some things, it gets a little cumbersome to carry around sometimes the primes and so forth. And so uh, roughly today, we're actually going to stop writing the primes, uh, and we're just going to assume that we are in the rotating frame. Um, someday when I have draw on what I call my pool of infinite free time. I'm going to rework all of my lecture notes, and I'm going to put the laboratory frame in the prime, so I can drop it early in the class, and then just stick with not prime later. But I haven't done that yet. So anyway, note to self. Uh, OK, so both coordinate frames uh, share the same z-axis, and that's important to us, right? The, in terms of how we mathematically deal with these things, uh, that's an important concept. Um, we talked also about circularly polarized fields last time. And the idea was you could, if you wanted to, generate a linearly polarized field. That's just a B1 field that oscillates back and forth along a single axis. That B1 field mathematically is the same as having uh, the sum of a clockwise and a counterclockwise circularly polarized field. And the point of showing you this wasn't that we would use these two fields to generate a linearly polarized field. The point was to say, in fact, all you really need is this clockwise circularly polarized field, because this second field component over here is, is sort of of no consequence. It doesn't help excite the spins, and it does heat up the patient. And so you can basically turn that field off, and you'll still have uh, you'll have a very useful, in fact, even more useful RF field. 
So this is the form of the R fields that we actually use in MR. Uh, uh, fields that are circularly polarized. And so you see it as being circularly polarized because you can see it has an envelope function that's affected by both a cosine term and a sine term. And so that's the, gen the more general form of the B1 fields that we use. We could turn this field on, but all it's really going to do is heat up the patient without contributing to oxidation. So it's not Okay, so those are just some general concepts that we've covered. And then we did a fair bit of math to, to uh, appreciate the difference between the equation of motion uh, in the laboratory frame, what we got through in the second lecture, and then what we figured out in the third uh, lecture uh, just on Tuesday, which is the equation of motion for an ensemble of spin, that is the bulk magnetization, but now in the so-called rotating frame. And, you know, it, it didn't really get that much more complicated. What we had to introduce uh, was this uh, be effective uh, we let the effective just be the sum of these two field terms that are on the right-hand side. Um, what is B effective? B effective is just this B field for the bulk magnetization experiences in the rotating frame. So, you know, what do we do? We build systems in the lab frame, right? That's what we're able to do. We're able to build things in the lab frame. Mathematically, the rotating frame is more convenient. So what's the B field in the rotating frame? Well, it's the sum of two things. It's the sum of this so-called fictitious field. And this fictitious field is always going to be there. Anytime you're dealing with trying to figure out what's B effective, you're always going to have that term. Um, and so that's this fictitious field that effectively, effectively demodulates the effects of this B0 field. And for the systems that we're designing and concerned with and worried about in this class, there's always going to be some external B0 field. People have been very imaginative about other ways of using the, the NMR principle for imaging. There are, other, there are other possible systems that we don't talk about. And then the second part of this is the applied B field, but described in the rotating frame. And that's where, the, that's where things got, a, not tricky, but a little bit trickier. And so what you, if you want to work with the equation of motion in the rotating frame, you have to figure out B effective. To figure out B effective, you always have this fictitious field plus the B field in the rotating frame. And so that's, we went through a couple different exercises of free and forced precession when we added in those terms. And it basically uh, ended up looking like this. Um, just by way of substitution, we can have the maybe simplest form of the equation of motion in the rotating frame. Okay, so what were the examples that we worked through? It looked something like this. We knew what B effective was going to be. It was just our fictitious field plus our externally applied field. The externally applied field is just the B0 field, and it shares the k-axis. So easy enough. We can figure out omega rote. It just comes and is driven by that B0 field. And so our B effective for free precession is, is the zero field. There is no effective field. And so this is a trivial result. It's not terribly interesting. We can work through uh, the equation of motion, get out this determinant term, take all the cross products, and get a system of differential equations, all of which are equal to zero. So it just tells us that the mx component doesn't change with time, the y component doesn't change with time, the mz component doesn't change with time. So there's not really anything interesting happening in the, uh, so to speak, uh, in the rotating frame when we're talking about just free precession. Things got a little bit more interesting uh, the next time around because then we said, well, hold on, let's go ahead and add a B1 field this time. Um, and the B1 field, uh, when, we, when we took a circularly polarized field, right, that's what we started with, we took a circularly polarized field, we transformed it into the rotating frame. A circularly polarized field in the rotating frame doesn't have both of those uh, sort of sine and cosine components to it because it's no longer uh, it's no, it doesn't look circularly polarized in the rotating frame. So what you end up with is you still have your external B0 field uh, expressed in the rotating frame. Not too interesting. It just goes from K prime, goes from K to K prime. And then you have your B1 field. And your B1 field looks a little bit more interesting now, or simpler, I guess, because uh, it doesn't have those circularly polarized terms, that sine and cosine term attached to it. Okay, what do we do? We figure out what's our B effective at that point. We have the two terms that cancel. Uh, that makes sense to us. This fictitious field is just demodulating or getting rid of the apparent effects of the B0 field. So those things just cancel. And we're just left with this, in this case, an envelope function. The envelope function's uh, acting about uh, a direction, or it has a direction associated with it. It's the I prime direction. But the I prime direction is a rotating vector, right? In the rotating frame, it's constant. In the laboratory frame, we see that vector as rotating. Okay, so we know what our B effective is, we know what the equation of motion is, plug in B effective, solve that determinant to get a system of equations. 
system of equations looked a little bit more interesting, uh, but in fact it looked a lot like the equation of motion that we saw for free precession in the laboratory. Um, and the result of working through this um, uh, was uh, the, the sort of last thing that we did, albeit maybe a little rushed, uh, the last thing we did was looked at solutions to those differential equations. They were coupled, we can decouple them, and we can come up with an answer. Uh, and, the, and the general answer looked something like this for the specific V1 field, the V1, uh, uh, V1 of E field that we applied. Nothing was happening to X, uh, but our M and, uh, MY and MZ were coupled. We decoupled those things and you end up with these expressions. And what it looks like is it has some initial uh, magnitude of the magnetization, MZ zero, however much you're starting with from your, what we call the initial condition. And then the amount of y you have, my magnetization, or the amount of mz magnetization that you have as a function of time depends inherently on what is the underlying v1 envelope function. And we can choose those envelope functions. They can be rect functions, they can be synced functions, Gaussians, hypersecants, all kinds of things. Um, and what we didn't uh, spend enough time sort of developing was this concept that uh, inside of these sine and cosine terms, this integral of the v1 field really is the flip angle. And how I motivated that, at least um, conceptually, was that the stronger the V1 field I have, or the longer that V field is active for, the more I'm going to be uh, manipulating my magnetization, the more I'll be flipping my magnetization. And so, uh, by definition, this is the flip angle. Um, one of the other things that we did is introduce this concept of, of rotations and how to take into account both the flip angle and the phase of the RF pulse. Uh, when you design a pulse sequence, you need a particular flip angle to have the effect on the magnetization that you want. And in fact, choosing the phase can be just as important. Sometimes it doesn't matter, sometimes it really matters. And so uh, we worked through some steps to develop this idea of, a, of what we call an RF pulse operator. Uh, and you'll need this in the first homework assignment. So we, will, uh, we can revisit it from the perspective of the homework event. Um, hopefully this, you know, even if it looks a bit complicated, it really is just a bunch of sines and cosines. Uh, I've given you code that already has this written up, so that part should, should be fine. Uh, and hopefully you can appreciate that this is a rotation operator. Rotation operator can act on a vector, and it produces a new vector. Um, if what you did was plug in alpha of 90, right, if, that, if you had a 90 degree arc pulse that you wanted, and you chose the, the theta, the phase, to be zero, perfectly good choice, you'll end up with a pretty simplified matrix here of just zeros and ones and maybe some minus ones. And what that will do is it will take your bulk magnetization and it'll put it wherever it should land at the end of that, that RF pulse, because the end of the RF pulse is the full alpha, right? In your homework assignment, what you're actually going to be doing is stepping through incrementally. You don't, you're, the, the total V1 you want, or the total flip angle you want is 90 degrees, but you're gonna be generating some plots that show me the steps of getting to 90 degrees. And so I think I suggested a number of time points, a thousand time points, or a hundred time points. Time points doesn't matter too much. Um, how do you do that? Well, you're just gonna incrementally, you're, you're gonna have like a delta alpha. You're gonna tip it by one degree, you're gonna tip it again by one degree, tip it again by one degree. If you do that 90 times, the composite action is 90 degrees. Conceptually, is that okay? Questions? I see yeses and I see no questions and some nods, some affirmative nods. Okay, we'll revisit it uh, at, the, at the end in the, with regards to the homework if we need to. Um, so here I'm just saying it a little bit more explicitly. The flip angle is gamma times the integral of the V1 envelope function. Uh, uh, and, if, and if that's not, Obvious, you could you could think to yourself, or, or we'll develop this concept in the, in the, in the notes that we work out on the board. Um, uh, let's handle it that way. Okay, so uh, I also offered this sort of notation that we'll use in this class, which is uh, we'll talk about an RF pulse as an operator, and that operator has a phase and it has a flip angle. The easiest initial condition we have is just that the bulk magnetization points along uh, the z axis, right? So um, so. So uh, in this case here, what is my m vector? If I write my m vector this way. We covered this a couple times. So what's the m vector that I have for my initial 
for the components. Right? And the other way you could write this, if this is the, the total initial condition, which would be M00, uh, zero, zero, say M0. What's the distinction? Sorry, it's a little sloppy. I feel like a here. Um, what's the distinction between MZ0 and M0? Who wants to give that a shot? Um, yeah. Uh, close. So, so first part, definitely right. M0 is the total available magnetization. We're, we're considering some volume that we care about, right? It's a pixel, it's whatever, right? And so there's a total maximum amount of magnetization we can, we can have from that sample, given the temperature, given the D0 field, whatever. Uh, so that's, that's right. That MZ0, uh, anytime we write the component with a superscript zero, we're talking about an initial condition. And that just means that at some point in time, I could have some level of magnetization, and I'll take that as my initial condition. We'll work through some examples that'll be a, a little bit more clear. Um, but after an RF pulse, I have a certain amount of magnetization, and the amount of magnetization that I have on the Z component would be my initial condition for things that happen subsequently. Um, we'll work through some examples of that. Okay, so we saw, we saw one of these uh, earlier. This is an RF pulse, and we can figure out for ourselves what's the flip angle and what's the phase. So if that's the initial condition, uh, what's the flip angle for this pulse? 90, right? What's the phase? What axis is it phased about? Y, right? Positive Y, thank you. And so left-hand rotations, V1 fields cause left-hand rotations in the bulk magnetization. So finger along Y, and I rotate 90. Enough. What about this one? What's my flip angle? 180, right? So if I play my V1 pulse long enough, I can do I can do 360s. I might not want to do that, but I could have my bulk magnetization go all the way around and come back to home. I could have a 2,423 degree pulse, right? And the bulk magnetization would just go around and around and around however many times, right? And stop wherever. So there's no limit on how much you can act on the bulk magnetization. There's maybe some practical reasons why you choose a flip angle, but uh, you continue to act on the bulk magnetization. What's the phase for that pulse? Right, yeah, so that's the best answer in anything. So everyone's correct, right? I can get to that orientation with any arbitrary uh, phase. Right? I can do that by flipping around the y-axis, I can do it by flipping around the z-axis, uh, x-axis, minus y, somewhere in between x and y. And so for inversion pulses, it almost doesn't matter what your phase is. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to that, we'll revisit that topic when we really use inversion pulses for imaging and refocusing pulses and so forth. Uh, but in principle, it doesn't matter. Uh, let's see, Michael, I'm not used to doing it on here, so. Okay, and then one more, here. So uh, flip angle, easy, these are, these are softballs, right? What's flip angle? 90 degrees, what's the phase? Uh, what angle, yeah, so different answers, great. So I heard 90, and that's correct, right? So zero degrees was our x-axis, and if I rotate 90 degrees, I'd be pointing along the y-axis, so the other axis would be y-axis, and now I'm tipping down. Uh, so get comfortable with that sort of idea, right? That we can flip the magnetization in, in, along different paths, right? Yeah. So what's the difference between the phase for A and C? The difference between A and C? Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's great. It wasn't even supposed to be a trick question. That's a copy-paste problem. Sorry. Um, so, sorry about that. Uh, so there is no difference. Uh, right, so, uh, yeah. no, 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 that's total copy-paste error, that's funny. So the bulk magnetization for C is actually supposed to point along minus Y, right? So picture, okay, let's see if we can do it this way, right? So the, where it was supposed to go was this way, right? That's a better, slightly better question. So now, Tyler, what's the phase? Yeah, so I have to go, I have to go along and flip along this, either the minus x-axis, or I heard someone else, maybe Tyler was you, 180, right? So I have to go all the way around. Those are, there's, uh, so that's a, a better question with a better answer. Uh, thanks for
Uh, so we'll talk quickly. This was uh, this was supposed to be covered in the last lecture. We didn't have time to get there. RF pulses are going to come up a lot. We use them for every our, uh, every pulse sequence, right? And a big part of what we'll spend time talking about in this class is what are called pulse sequences. Uh, coordinated sequences of events, sequences of RF pulses, and soon gradients uh, that will help us generate image contrast and then help us generate images themselves as well. Uh, so lots of examples of different RF pulses. We have excitation pulses, we have inversion pulses, uh, refocusing pulses, saturation pulses, spectrally selective pulses, spectral spatial pulses. I mean, the list kind of goes on and on. Uh, in this class, we won't have a chance to get into the details of this. If you take 229, which, uh, which is sort of the advanced class that follows this, uh, you'll have a chance to explore some of these other ideas. There really are some really neat things you can do with MR. We'll learn about how it's possible to only excite fat, for example, or only excite water, for example. Uh, you can have chemically selective uh, pulses and so forth. So there really are some, some pretty wild things that can be done. But for this class, uh, we'll keep it uh, relatively simple. We'll just be talking about these kinds of RF pulses. Uh, so what's an excitation pulse? Well, an excitation pulse tips the MZ magnetization into the transverse plane. It doesn't mean it tips it entirely into the transverse plane. That's a 90 degree pulse. But if I can generate some transverse magnetization, that's usually going to be some kind of an excitation pulse. Uh, they're typically short. We can do this very quickly. You'll work through the map on some of these, but you'll see you can do this in just a couple hundred microseconds, maybe a few milliseconds. Um, they are, in fact, non-uniform across the slice thickness. This is a concept we'll have to develop later. Uh, in MR, one thing that we do is we can excite a slice, the slice that we want to image. Uh, but the flip angle won't be constant through the slice. It might not be constant uh, within the slice. We talked about B1 in homogeneity last time. Uh, the B1 pulse can be imperfect within the slice. It's also uh, mathematically going to be non-uniform through the thickness of the slice, and that has sort of an impact on images and image quality and so forth. Uh, so if you shim each slice, would that give you the best results for the slice? If you do it slice by slice and say the volume? Yeah, so but shimming is a shimming's a different topic. So shimming deals with B0. Shimming okay. gives us a, a more and more perfect B0 field. An important thing, if you shim on every slice, it can be time consuming. Um, the problem that we have in terms of it being non-uniform here is, is the following. Uh, when you turn on a slice selection gradient, you'll have a range of frequencies for that slice, and an RF pulse that's band limited is infinitely long. So that's, that's a lot. We're going to come back to that topic, but we don't use infinitely long RF pulses, so we have to truncate them, and that will lead to slice profile effects. Uh, but a topic I'm happy to talk about, but we won't go down that road too much uh, right now. Please. What that means is you effectively will get this imperfect slice profile. Um, and it's also, I just said this, right, it can be non-uniform within the slice, and that's what we call B1 in homogeneity. Um, that's that non-uniform signal intensity across the field of view. One of the hardest things in MR, aside from sort of like all of the math and then this concept of Fourier imaging that we get through in the sort of middle third of the class, one of the hardest things is when you're faced with an MR image and someone says, what's wrong, right? What, why does that image look as terrible as it does? And that, <laughs> that's going to happen. Um, and so, and, and doing that inverse problem, looking at an image and figuring out what causes that artifact can be very tricky because it could be B0, it could be B1, it could be all these different things, and then figuring out a solution is even trickier. We'll spend time talking about artifacts. Um, not quite right. So uh, this you've seen the 90 degree excitation pulse a bunch of times. The only distinction I'm making here is we could use what we call a small flip angle pulse. Lots of pulse sequences just want to tip a few degrees. Lots of reasons for that. We'll get into the details today, but we have pulse sequences that tip by five degrees or 60 degrees. It's not always 90s and 180s and so forth. Uh, uh, interestingly, we have a, this concept of inversion pulses, right? So that's maybe not an entirely obvious thing. Uh, I showed you a, an example just a second ago. Um, typically, they're going to be 180 degree pulses. I'm going to take my bulk magnetization. I'm going to turn it upside down. But in principle, if it's less than 180 degrees, but it still gives me some negative MZ component, that would be an inversion pulse. So if you went 91 degrees, it's not a very good inversion pulse, but you do have some negative MZ magnetization. Uh, so you're going to invert your MZ magnetization to minus Z. Uh, on, under ideal circumstances, you won't generate any MXY. Right? It'll just go through that transverse plane, and it'll be perfectly inverted, uh, and then it'll relax from there. 
Uh, we have so-called hard, hard pulses. Those are B1 pulses that are constant in amplitude. We call them hard pulses. You've seen the rect function already. So if we just turn our field on, turn it off, without modulating it very much, just on and off, that's called a hard pulse or, or a rect pulse. Um, and, and those are good. Those, those will help you form what are called good inversion pulses. Uh, uh, another possibility is what's called a soft or amplitude modulated pulse. You've seen this at least mathematically already, these V1 envelope functions, sync functions, Gaussians, whatever. And those are what we call soft pulses, just to distinguish them from the hard or the rect pulse. Um, and those can be frequency, spatially or spectrally selective. Again, not, not getting into the details, but these are intermediate bandwidth pulses uh, that can be uh, useful for selecting very specific things, selecting fat, selecting selecting a region of space, uh, like whereas uh, these hard pulses are very uh, high bandwidth pulses. Uh, and then this, that's a subtlety for now, they're typically followed by what's called a, a pressure gradient. And so this is just an example of how that uh, bulk magnetization would proceed uh, were an RF, uh, were an inversion pulse. And so we can see in this case, uh, well, okay, so it's 180 degrees, what's the phase of the RF pulse? Zero, right? So just pointing along x, so x or zero would be a good answer. And we saw it a little while ago. I could, in fact, this path tells me specifically what is the phase, right? It has to be the zero degree phase to follow that particular path. I could generate another simulation for you guys where the uh, phase was about the y-axis or, or the phase of 90 degrees, and the path would look differently, right? So the end result of an inversion pulse might be the same, inverted magnetization, but the path to get there Sometimes you care about uh, Other concept to, uh, to just in terms of thinking about RF pulses, uh, and we'll, we'll see applications and uses of these things as we develop our sort of uh, dictionary of RF pulse sequences and so forth. Uh, these are also uh, typically 180 degree pulses, and I'll, I'll try to help you understand why, why you could have a refocusing pulse be a 180 and an inversion pulse be a 180. Uh, not, that's not inconsistent. Uh, it will ideally produce what we call refocused transverse magnetization. I'll show you one animation that will make that a little bit more clear. We're getting just a touch ahead of ourselves because we haven't talked about all these concepts yet. Uh, yeah. Uh, refocusing pulses are used in what's called a spin echo pulse sequence, something we'll talk about in two weeks. Um, and it's one of the basic pulse sequences that we use for generating signals that are useful, measurable, and um, and uh, the, this concept of refocusing, this, this, we've mostly talked about spins being on resonance, it's as if they're all just going to precess at the V0 alarm frequency, when in fact that's not exactly the case. V0 is not perfect, uh, there are chemical shielding effects from fat and other things, and so there's this milieu of resonance frequencies. Um, and if something is not perfectly on resonance, then we refer to it as being off resonance. If a spin is off resonance, then it will tend to dephase. It will tend to accumulate a phase relative to those on resonance spins because it has a slightly different processional frequency. And so those spins are going to be kind of drifting apart from each other in, in a processional uh, frequency or processional phase. Um, so, lots of reasons that we could have dephasing, imaging gradients, magnetic field inhomogeneity, V0 inhomogeneity, uh, susceptibility. We haven't talked too much about susceptibility. We'll come back to that topic too. Chemical shift, things like that, for example. Um, and it's typically also followed by a crusher gradient, which is just in distinction to the spoiler gradient that was used previously. Fair bit of, of sort of language here, uh, just trying to build some concepts right now. Uh, this is one example of what a refocusing pulse does. Uh, and I, I, this is a fine example, but I put it in what I think is an even better example. Uh, let's see if I can this. What you're going to see, I'll talk through it for a second first. What we have here is both magnetization pointing straight up. The first thing we're going to have is a 90 degree RF pulse. This is building up to what, a, what will ultimately give us what's called a spin echo. So the 90 degree pulse is going to tip the magnetization down. Now picture that you have, at this, with this representation, spins in lots of different positions. We just gathered them to have the same origin. And those spins in different positions actually see slightly different fields. The B0 is not perfect. There's a chemical shift 
effect, susceptibility, something. And so as a consequence of not seeing the same field, they're going to fan out, right? They would, in a rotating frame, they would just all point in the same direction. But in the rotating frame, if you have a slightly different B0, you're going to drift to the left or drift to the right, depending on what your specific uh, field you're exposed to is. And then what you'll see in the middle is this refocusing pulse, what we call the, the it's, it's like actually flips everything over like a pancake. And then those same sources of off resonance will actually push the spin system together. So there's the 90. The spins dephase. And this is the flipping over like a pancake. And then the same sources of off resonance. Ninety is going to tip it over. That's the off resonance. The one eighty flips it over like a pancake, and those same sources of off resonance bring it back together. We're getting up to soon this concept of forming an echo. When all the spins come back into phase with one another, they can induce the largest signal in the coil, uh, and that would be the most detectable thing that we can do. Um, so why is this? A, why do we think of it as a one eighty pulse? If you think of my fingers as being fanned out like those off resonance spins. And then the pencil is just the z-axis. The 180, think about what happens to the z-axis when I flip everything over like a pancake, right? My z-axis has gone through a 180. And so its magnitude, its flip angle is still a 180. Uh, it's similar to the inversion pulse, but we're just considering it in the context of what happens to the transverse magnetization. Uh, this is, there are some subtleties, there are some subtle differences between inversion pulses and refocusing pulses. Uh, mathematically, they look a lot the same for how we treat them. Okay, so uh, a couple uh, concepts still from the B1 lecture that I want to uh, clear up. So I'll switch over and work on the board for a little bit. Uh, and then we'll actually get started with, uh, with today's lecture, which is the block equations and equations. Questions about sort of you know, what, what we covered in the first lecture? Or the things that sort of concepts that I just went through? We worked through a couple of examples together. So we'll clear up. Okay, so I'm going to switch over here. Uh, I brought the notes for the second part, but not for this part. This, uh, I'm trying to think which parts I wanted to get through here. This is all the B1 stuff. Um, maybe what I'll do is just post a page of notes uh, on the web. The, um, the main concept that I wanted to get across was this idea about the, the B1 field. So let's, let's see if we can do it anyway. Um, so we have the processional behavior of omega, right? And the amount of precession you have depends on gamma and the external B fields, right? Uh, so we can think of omega equal to gamma B. But specifically here, what we want to think about is what happens if we're talking about the B1 field, and then we can talk about the rotation and the frequency of precession due just to the B1 field. Okay. And all I'm trying to just give you a little bit more of a handle on is, is how this gives rise to uh, rotation excitation and how that in turn looks like something like the flip angle. It's relatively simple. Um, if we integrate a frequency from zero to some time, tau, uh, maybe that's the duration of some RF pulse. So on this axis here, I can think about having an RF pulse. This is time. This is my B1 field. And I turn my B1 field on for some period of time. Maybe I turn it on at time zero, and I turn it off at time tau. Uh, if I want to integrate the frequency as a function of time, that'll give me a phase. Integrating frequency gives you a phase. Phases are just angles. So this is a relatively simple one where we say, well, I can integrate omega 1 as a function of time. And on the right hand side here, then I'm just integrating gamma b1 in the rotating. 
the left hand side itself is just a uh, is just a finite uh, integral, um, and so I could write this. Uh, I guess what I want to write here is yeah, this this really is just a flip angle uh, equal to the integral of gamma d or t. Uh, not not especially profound derivation. This is really by definition that this is an integral. Um, what I had in my notes, and I'll have to share with you guys later, is if we, if we want to uh, give a proper mathematical treatment to using this rect function, then we can do so, and we can see uh, the, what the result. So let, let's say if our d1, d, and t is a rect function. Rect functions, I find Uh, the result of this will just end up looking like alpha is equal to, say, B1 max. So this RF pulse here has some maximum amplitude associated with it. Uh, it's equal to B1 max times tau RF. Uh, so sometimes we do it. And so this becomes a, a relatively easy design problem. We saw an example actually so midway through the last lecture. Uh, the problem we're usually uh, oftentimes faced with is that we have a specific alpha that we want, right? We want a 90 degree pulse, we want a 180 degree pulse. And so we pick our alpha. Gamma, of course, is, is, is defined for us by the kind of the species that we're interested in. Our system usually has a maximum D1 max. And so then the design problem is simple. What is the time that will give you the flip angle that you want? It's a single You'll need that in your first, one of the first parts of one of your first homework problems. Just that you can define uh, and figure out what is the duration of the arc. What is the duration of the arc? Specifically, um, So, in the absence of having sort of all of the steps worked out, uh, conceptually, is that okay? Does that make sense? There's, uh, like I said, there's another example I was going to show you guys, but maybe I'll post that on the next step. Uh, in which case, uh, I'll wrap. D1 lecture. Um, we'll, yeah, so we wrap on the D1 lecture. Why don't we go ahead? It's a little early. We'll take a break now, and then we'll come back and get into uh, the block equations and relaxation, which is the lecture I asked you to watch. I cut out most of the slides. We'll go through some high level concepts, maybe half an hour, and then we'll open it up to talk more about that. Good? Yeah, it's a little hard to talk about one, but okay. because you have this sort of spin up, spin down nonsense. Okay. So, but, but that's okay. So, what does the precession look like just in the Does it have some angle? Yeah, yeah, there's some, there's some, there's unfortunately some various descriptions here. I think part of the problem is this it's really difficult to bridge between our, our understanding what's happening at the quantum level and our classical description of the phenomenon. So in this class, we skip to the bulk magnetization. Right? So, so let's do that for a second, and we can go back to the one. So the concept of bulk magnetization is we've got billions of things doing something, but we're just going to treat them as acting like one coherent vector magnetization vector. When that vector is pointing exactly the equilibrium to one z-axis, there, there's no sort of observable precession, right? Because it's, because it's because it, because it all sums to zero, but also because it's pointed exactly along the z. If I tip it in micro right, just barely, then you will see this behavior. Right? But as it relaxes, it becomes not observable. Right? And there's a difference between rotating this way, which is going to like spin, and precession, which is doing this. Right? So the bulk magnetization still has spin, if you will, but it has no observable precession. As soon as you tip it, Micro the top axis it has a transverse angle, and that precessional behavior. Spike goes up. If you want to bridge back to the quantum stuff, it gets a little more complicated. You can do a mean to 
I don't know if that might be this, this idea you were sort of thinking of on it. So have an anchor like relative to the gravity. Yeah. Yeah. So then there, then there is this other uh, description of what's happening. So this is on x, y, and z axis. Uh, most of the descriptions I'm familiar with say, well, it's spin up and spin down, but but it's actually slightly off axis, and they're all out of phase. Right? So they form this cone uh, around the z axis, and that there's a population that spins down here, then it goes into the not as well. But they form a the cone down here as well. And there's more of them. There's more of them. Z uh, component is greater than zero, right? But because they're all phased in different possible orientations, they can be anywhere in the equilibrium state of just having B zero and the M, uh, so the M X is zero. The sum of the X is zero. The sum of the M Y is zero. The sum of the X is zero. That's the kind of spin level. Yeah, so there's different descriptions. So this is the, this is the oh, yeah, inside it's like that. Yeah. Uh, well, no. Um, what we're looking at is, is basically the magnitude of the poles, right? And so the B1 poles, the angle of the brain, you're actually trying to internalize. Yeah. Right? So we can draw the E1 poles to the rotating frame or the magnetic frame. If I draw to the rotating frame, I would write it just like this with the magnetic frame. Right? Oh, okay. If I want to write it in the laboratory frame, then I need, then, then there's this high frequency. This is also yeah. So we'll see if I can stick to my uh, my promise of playing the only my British early, right? Um, so so this uh, this lecture, right? So we only just finished the last lecture, so to speak. This one is about block equations and relaxation. There's a fascinating story here. The background of this picture is one of the first patents in MR uh, given granted to a guy named Ray Dumanian. Um, and if anyone wants to go to happy hour, you hear the Ray Dumanian story. It's wild. Uh, so he's filthy rich, and everyone hates him. That's great. That's uh, it's an interesting story. Uh, leave it at that. Um, learning objectives, again, these will just keep you focused or on target for what I think is important about the material that we're talking about. I'm not going to spend time specifically going through those. Um, what's this lecture about? Well, it's really in part about these two guys, right? So the 1952 Nobel Prize in Physics. MR has a lot of Nobel Prizes in and around the field, not the imaging per se, but the chemistry and the physics on those. Uh, so these guys, Felix Bloch and Ed Purcell, uh, got the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in '52 for their developments related to um, magnetic precision measurements, and being able to measure what's happening to a spin system. Um, and I'm, you, you, if you took to a five year, you probably heard me say it, but I think if there should be a documentary about this. It would be the best documentary ever, and it would be George Clooney and Ed Harris. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if they'll read my script ever. Okay. 
So uh, block equations with relaxation, this is what we're talking about today. And again, the lecture material, the online lecture sort of covered some of this uh, already. What do we see here? Well, uh, we're adding something here. And we'll, we'll make this kind of distinction as best I can between the laboratory and the rotating frame again, right? And so here in the laboratory frame, we have the equation of motion on the front end. But it kind of would be surprising if the equation of motion sort of held all by itself, right? Because it would say unusual things like, once the spin system was perturbed, it would just stay in that perturbed state, maybe with some precession. So we don't really expect that. We expect a return to equilibrium. I think it should go back to their equilibrium state. And that's really what the relaxation terms uh, drive. They drive the MX and MY components to decay. So any transverse magnetization is unstable. It will decay away. And it drives the MZ magnetization to return to the end off condition. Not obvious from the expressions themselves. Uh, no surprise, we'll work through some solutions uh, today. Uh, so what's the challenge? Well, we've got an ordinary differential equation that's coupled and nonlinear. So general solutions are, are out of bounds. Uh, we will work on some simplified cases and some simplified uh, considerations. So there's really no analytic solution in general. Uh, we will work through the simple cases, and then you have to start getting into simulations. And part of what this class will do will give you the sort of mathematical tools for understanding this, but also some simulation tools for dealing with this as a way of getting a little bit more hands-on with uh, what the spin system does. Somewhat remarkably, and, uh, and in some ways uh, disappointing, is these two terms on the left-hand side, they're just phenomenological. What does that mean? Well, the, the business on the left, the equation of motion, we were able to derive that for the most part. There was one empirical expression experimentally derived that we had to rely on. Magnetic moment is equal to gamma times the spinning and the momentum. Uh, here, these relaxation terms are also phenomenological. That means they just capture the behavior. They describe the behavior of what's observed experimentally. They do a really good job. Uh, there are exponential sort of functions in nature for a reason, right? Uh, but these are not, uh, they don't sort of exactly capture the underlying spin physics, if you will. Nevertheless, we use them, we use them widely, and they work uh, exceedingly. Um, so just quickly going through the terms, we know that first term gives rise to precession. I sort of said it already. The second term is so-called transverse relaxation, the decay of the MX and MY components. And, this, and the third term is longitudinal relaxation. Um, we know that the relaxation term itself uh, depends on things like T1 and T2. We'll talk a little bit about T1 and T2. T1 changes are slow on the order of hundreds of milliseconds. T2 changes are faster on the order of sort of tens of milliseconds. Uh, and interestingly, and I'll show you some examples, the magnitude of the bulk magnetization vector can actually be made zero. So don't think of the magnitude of this vector. Don't think of it as being a, you know, a block of wood that we spin around and flip up and down. We can actually annihilate, if you will, the bulk magnetization at least transiently. And that's a useful thing for getting rid of signals. Um, and as these equations are phenomenological, they can also capture other things, right? We won't spend, unfortunately, too much time talking about diffusion in this class. It's a fascinating topic. Uh, it's really amazing that MR is able to explore the diffusive regime uh, by uh, understanding what's happening to the spin system as it diffuses and moves around. There's some really uh, fantastic science being done in diffusion imaging, but uh, it's not a topic we'll be able to dig into in this class. Uh, so this is one of the movies that was supposed to play last time. This is the process of relax, uh, sorry, of excitation. We saw the spins tip into the transverse plane, and now they're precessing around. Uh, it popped back there pretty quick. Let me see if we can do it again. So uh, here is the excitation process: RF energy going in, tipping the spin system over. And they precess. We can pick up a signal, but it's not stable, and they will eventually relax back to their equilibrium state. So they kind of pop back to that home state. Um, and that's the concept, again, of relaxation. Uh, we can write these equations again in the rotating frame. We won't go through the, the sort of madness of actually getting us there. Uh, it still looks a lot like what we saw previously. Uh, we have to remember to use the B effective field, so we have to make sure we're using the right B field, so to speak. And then the relaxation terms actually look very, very similar. We just have to keep track of our of the components, the uh, I hats and J hats and J hats, but uh, largely the same. Uh, this, we spent some time talking about uh, uh, this morning, uh, or earlier in the lecture, rather. Uh, and so and we saw a couple of examples. I'll work through one or two of 
So what's so interesting about this idea of T1 and T2 relaxation? Well, the main thing that's really amazing, it's another one of the reasons you know, that we even have this class, right, is because T1s and T2s are tissue-dependent properties, right? So almost everything is processing at the larmer frequency. That's because we're <coughs> largely sensitive to hydrogen, um, hydrogen bound to water for that matter. But the actual relaxation time constants, the rate at which the magnetization changes, either relaxing back along MZ or decaying on MXY, is tissue dependent. So gray matter and white matter have different T1s and have different T2s. And as a consequence, we can change timing parameters. We can go to the MR scanner. I can put any one of you as individuals into the scanner. We can acquire images. And just by adjusting timing parameters on the scanner, we can get images with remarkably different contrasts. We talked about this in, I think, the first lecture. That one of the main advantages, the principal advantages of MR is so-called soft tissue contrast. And this really is pretty remarkable when you think about what's available through other so here we can go from you know very very flat, arguably uh, uninteresting images to images with a huge amount of contrast that may or may not be diagnostically useful. Uh, and then if you look at these two images on the left, the contrast within the within the brain is actually somewhat inverted. Uh, so there's a lot of flexibility here, if you will. And a big uh, big part of what MR is all about is trying to figure out well what's the most useful contrast, what's the most meaningful contrast. How does the contrast tell us something about disease, or how does the contrast tell us something about some underlying mechanism of what's happening to that tissue? And that and that's where the, the tricky business is. It's uh, MR, uh, for all its strengths, is also um, relatively non-specific, right? So if I see a tissue uh, in an image that has a certain brightness, the brightness alone doesn't tell me anything. Right? It's not a PET detector. I'm not counting photons. Uh, it's a it's a contrast detector, and contrast is is uh, is in some sense non-specific. If we look uh, at what can happen with images, or what we can do in terms of manipulating the image contrast, uh, we'll, we'll come back to this concept later as well, but we'll, we'll talk about it here. Uh, so it's possible that my initial condition would produce negative and not. How would I do that? This is actually relevant to your homework assignment as well. What do you need to get negative and not? What kind of, how do you have to act on your spin system? Inversion, right? So you need an inversion pulse to give you a minus M none. So that just means at that time point, So at this point in time, uh, we would say that the initial condition, M, Z, zero. So we're just considering what happens from, say, this time forward, right? My M, Z, zero at that point in time is what? What's my X component if I've inverted my magnetization? Zero. What's my Y component? Zero. And what's my M, Z, or what's my M, Z component? So there's your initial condition from that point forward. So we oftentimes update the initial condition, right? We've done something in the spin system, now I want to know what's going to happen. So my initial condition would be this particular vector. Uh, I think it'll show up in a second, but we'll, we'll work through it now really quickly. What if I played a 90 degree pulse? What would my M, Z, uh, what would my, sorry, I didn't write that right. So this would just, this really just be my M vector, right? my n vector, my initial vector. Uh, I'll come back to the second example, actually, because it'll pop up on the slide in just a second. So this is a little bit OK. So in this case here, I've played an inversion pulse, right? And I, and I took an image. If I take an image right away, we'll talk about how to form images later. But if I take an image right away, there's basically no relaxation. So it doesn't really matter. Uh, what your T1 is or what your T2 is. And that's why this image is pretty flat in contrast, right? Nothing's had an opportunity to relax yet. And so they all have very similar magnitudes, nothing particularly interesting happening. The only thing that really stands out is the skull, and the skull is not kind of more active in bone, right? Uh, what's, what happens next? So that, uh, another thing to keep in mind, and this is uh, perhaps, again, getting ahead of ourselves a little bit, is in MR, we always look at the magnitude of the magnetization. We have a really hard time detecting its phase. 
that's, that's a complex topic that'll, that'll come up later. But for now, just trust me that we, have, we really just look at the most often only look at the magnitude of the image. And so if my magnetization is inverted, it's hard for me to know whether it's minus or whether it's plus because we look at the magnitudes of things. And so the relaxation curve for a particular tissue will follow these kind of rectified curves, all positive valued curves. What does that mean? Well, if I try to take an image at a later point in time, uh, I might get this image here. And at this point in time, my white matter curve is the lowest curve. The lowest curve will be the lowest intensity. And in this particular image, you can see the arrow pointing to the white matter, and the white matter is darker than, say, the gray matter. The gray matter has a higher signal intensity, uh, and it looks a little bit brighter. And that's, you can compare also to CSF, although it's maybe not quite as distinct. We can go to another time point. So at this time point, I played an inversion pulse uh, back at this time zero, and I wait in a certain amount of time. And if I wait a certain amount of time, I can actually get a particular compartment to be very, very dark particular compartment that has that T1. And so in this case, the white matter is basically invisible to us. Its magnetization is recovering along MZ. It hits what we call the null point. And if I try to take a picture, there's nothing there for me to take a picture of, so to speak. But I can still see the gray matter. I can still see fat. I can still see other things. And then if we go out and wait uh, even longer, because of this kind of unusual balance in the magnitude images, what we can uh, the image contrast that we can generate is somewhat inverted compared to this earlier image, wherein the white matter is above and brighter, and the gray matter is below and darker. And so this is just an example of how the, uh, the magnetization changes as a function of time for different uh, tissue types, right? Play an inversion pulse, and the trick in MR is saying, well, when do I want to take my picture? Do I want to take it really early? Probably not, because that's going to give me a really flat color. Uh, do I want to take it really, really late? What would happen? What would happen if I tried to take a picture really, really late? Which of these images would it look most like? First one, right? Now all of my tissue compartments have almost fully recovered. Let's say I've waited all the way over, right? They've all mostly recovered. And again, I don't have a trivially interesting image contrast. So MR is all about optimization, finding the time that's right for you. Too early is no good. Too late is no good. The answer is somewhere in the middle. That's an optimization. Um, the other component of relaxation that, uh, that I went through in that lecture that was online was T1 and T2 relaxation. And so this is just pointing out or comparing the differences between T1 and T2 relaxation. T1 relaxation is this drive towards equilibrium, getting back to that, uh, the bulk magnetization vector being pointed along this MZ direction. Uh, uh, part of that uh, return to equilibrium involves the decay of the transverse magnetization. Different tissues have different T2 time constants. They're going to decay with different rates. Um, at this point, it's maybe not obvious that this should be an exponential function, right? I showed you a differential equation. It had some cross products. It had some MX over T2 terms and MZ over T1 terms. Uh, what we will work through in just a second is, is why that ends up looking like an exponential function. But physically, if you will, this is what's happening uh, to the magnetization. Uh, we can look at what happens to the T2, uh, in, T in the example of T2-weighted imaging. Uh, and so we have these decay curves. The transverse magnetization is going to decay as a function of time, right? How do I generate the maximum amount of transverse magnetization? What kind of RF pulse gives me the most transverse magnetization? 90, right? Take it, point straight up, and I tip it all into the transverse plane. It's the most I can get. If I tip everything over, right, because everything's, let's say, on resonance, I tip them all over with a 90 degree RF pulse and take a picture as quickly as I can, I have, in this case, not entirely, but a reasonably flat image. There's not a lot of image contrast in this image. Uh, not as much as you see sort of later in this process. So uh, what's happening here is we're tipping the magnetization into the transverse plane, and we're taking pictures at different points and times after that event. And so the contrast is developing. Right? Depending on how much T2 decay there is for a compartment, that compartment will be more or less bright. Qualitatively, uh, the curves look something like what you see on the left, or on the top. CSF has a, a long time constant, so it decays pretty slowly. It's watery, and that's its characteristic. White matter and gray matter are actually just subtly different, but they will trace out different relaxation 
uh, imaging wise, the images underneath here don't fall along the timeline up above. You've got to look at what these what are called echo times for now. So we have to compress this event to match the time scale that's on the top of the picture. But you see the same kind of behavior. The CSF, which really surrounds uh, uh, the brain on the outside, you can see is quite bright at the end of this image. The CSF signal persists for a long time. It has a long time constant. White matter and gray matter tend to decay more quickly, and so the brain is reasonably dark when you get to that right-hand side image. So this is the qualitative sort of concept of, of T1 and T2 relaxation. And then, and then you should begin to think about this idea that if I can manipulate my magnetization and time with my imaging experiment appropriately, I can, get the, I can get interesting image contrast. Now, whether you want image contrast like this first image or like that last image, that, that's, a, that's a harder question to answer because it depends on the, the problem that you're trying to solve. But it's all possible. So it's okay. okay. Um, so we're going to work through two examples and then hopefully spend some time talking about the, the homework. Uh, the two examples that we're going to talk about are free precession in the rotating frame with relaxation. And so we're familiar with free, free, uh, free precession, we're familiar with rotating frame, uh, and now we have to add in this idea of relaxation. And then the second example that we'll work through is forced precession in the rotating frame with relaxation. And then we've kind of at least mathematically cover the different possibilities, and then we'll, we'll regroup a little bit, and I'll tell you what's kind of really important as, as regards this particular class. <coughs> uh, sorry, that's not supposed to come together quite like that. So that works. Okay, so what's on top? What's on top is the equation of motion in the rotating uh, coordinate system uh, with relaxation, right? We add on the relaxation terms on the right-hand side. If we're concerned with free precession, uh, first thing we have to do is define what's our V-effective field. We did this before. It turns out not to be that interesting, right? Uh, our V rot uh, basically offsets this omega rot. Um, uh, or, or, or sorry, the V-effective is the combination of this omega rot and the V rot. Uh, uh, v in the rotational field is just V0 K or K hat. And the sum of those two terms gives us an effective field of zero. So not a again, terribly interesting example as it regards the B effective field. What's nice about that is it basically knocks out the processional business in the front, right? So that part of the differential equation goes away, so to speak, in the rotating frame. And that makes sense to us because we said, you know, 10 minutes ago or even in the last lecture that the function or purpose of those first two teams is to capture the, the appearance of the processional behavior, but we're in the rotating frame, so we shouldn't see any processional behavior, and that term, in fact, and so we're left with a slightly simpler form of, of the uh, equation of motion if all we're concerned about is free precession. Um, and so this is just that same expression again. The left-hand term uh, uh, captures the transverse relaxation. It, 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 we call it the transverse relaxation because it refers to the x and y components. The decay of the x and y components depends only on T2. And then on the right-hand side, we have the longitudinal relaxation. Uh, which governs what happens to the MZ component. It's trying to get back to M0, and it does so as a function of the tissues T1, different T1s, different tissues. So there's no precession. We still see T1 and T2 relaxation. We drop off anything more complicated like diffusion. And what we're left with is a system of, in this case, first order linear, uh, and in fact, separable ordinary differential equations. Uh, and so this makes it, uh, if you have taken differential equations recently, uh, two of them are homogeneous, they're just equal to zero, and one of them is inhomogeneous. There's a constant term that we have to kind of deal with. So how we solve that system of differential equations is uh, slightly different than what we've seen before. Um, so the setup is uh, it's the following. We have an equation of motion, we think we know where it came from, but we don't know what the solutions look like. Um, you have an idea already, in fact, of what the solutions look like, because we've been talking about these exponential decay and exponential recovery curves. So by the time we work through this, you'll see explicitly where those uh, exponential functions actually come from. That's the, that's the goal. Okay? Okay. So that brings us uh, over to the board for the notes that I did actually. 
you guys have it in your notes a little bit or in the slides all, already. Um, what I'm going to do is go ahead and write out um, that last expression in sort of vector form. And so what we, what we would end up with, uh, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll start this out here. So this is going to be the description. This is going to be three per session. And this is relatively straightforward. All I'm going to do is write it out in sort of vector form. And so we have the time rate of change of the x and x prime component, dt, and the time rate of change of the Y component, and the time rate of change of the Z component, and that just forms a column vector, which is the left-hand side of the equation. And all the business that was on the right-hand side for the uh, equation of motion actually breaks down component-wise as well. And so we just have uh, the first term is a minus m. Y term looks like it's minus m y prime by t two, and the last term looks like as we look careful with our minus signs here. I'll leave it out in front for now. It's m z prime minus m not, and then that's dictated by the Titian score. So what might have looked like a somewhat complicated set of equations ends up being relatively simple. So what we're going to do is just look at that and look at the x prime component first, if you will. And so for the, uh, the mx prime component first. And so we can use what we call separation of variables. And we can write down that dmx prime by dt. This is just writing it explicitly. We get it to be a minus mx prime by dt2. Uh, I can separate variables. That means I want to get the x stuff on one side and the not x stuff on the other side. And so we write this as dmx prime over mx prime is equal to minus dt over t2. And that is just this thing called separation of variables. Uh, I can uh, say take the log of both sides. Uh, the log of dmx prime over mx is just the log of both sides. Now the answer to that, uh, I can write this as just the magnitude of mx prime. And that's equal to minus t over t to plus 7. And now uh, I can Integrate that just to give me an x prime is equal to t e to the minus t over t to plus uh, n times n times times <laughs> and so that just tells me uh, that my x prime uh, magnetization is going to be a is a function of some I should write this out t2 as a function of some t2 component. And there's a constant that is there as well. Um, so I could just write that one more time, a little bit more explicitly as mx prime of time is equal to some constant in front times e to the minus t over t2. So we just let e to the constant be some other constant. Um, I won't work through it, we could, but uh, you would similarly, because you have the same system of equations, uh, get a similar answer for the my component. And so we'll just write that as a my prime of time is equal to b 
And so those two terms there uh, is that where that transverse magnetization Um, obviously, uh, we don't just want A's and B's in there, so we can think about what's our initial condition coming in. Uh, so I can say, well, what is MX prime at time equal to zero? Uh, and that's just going to be equal to A from the expression uh, that we just wrote down. If time is zero, the exponential is one. Uh, but we always just write that as our initial condition, right? So this is just Do the same thing to y, my prime at time equals to zero. That would just give you some b, but we also know that that's really just our initial condition. So that whatever it is, the mx y zero and y zero could effectively be anything. Now, in a lot of this class, we won't care explicitly about the x component or the y component. We're more generally going to care about the, the magnitude or how much transverse magnitude. We variously care, oftentimes don't care what the phase of the transverse magnetization is. And so uh, we had an example, I won't move this up too far. Um, we had an example of combining these things together either in complex notation or using Euler's notation. So I can take my x and y components and write, and write it more compactly. And so a lot of times in this class, we'll just talk about mx, y. We don't care about x, we don't care about y specifically, we care about something. So mxy is a function of time. Uh, we saw this before. It's just mx prime uh, time on the i hat prime direction plus my prime on the j hat prime direction. So that's the sort of Cartesian component description of what's going on. We could write this uh, in complex notation, which is useful sometimes. We might write it as mx uh, zero if we, sorry, if we uh, adopt the, the solutions that we had before, we would write this as mx0 e to the minus t over t2 on the i hat prime direction plus my0 e to the minus t over t2 on the j um, Now, if I want to, I can write this in complex notation where what we care about usually is just the magnitude the magnetization, what we call just the magnitude of mxy. Uh, we still have this exponential term for decay, transverse decay, e to the minus t over t2. Um, but if we want to keep track of the phase, and sometimes you do, sometimes it's difficult, uh, then we need to add a phase term in here as well, e to the minus i times some phase. Uh, and that might be, say, the initial phase. And so this is. Uh, sort of the most complete description that we would have for the transverse magnetization of decay. We care about its magnitude, we care about its rate of decay, we sometimes care about the phase of magnetization. It's always the case, but sometimes. So that, um, this expression we'll use a fair bit. You'll we'll use it in your first homework assignment, and it basically again just tells us what happens to the magnitude of the transverse magnetization as a Oftentimes, we'll just let the phase be zero because we're not going to be uh, either carefully keeping track of it or we don't specifically care uh, what the phase is. Okay. So that was just uh, part of the problem, right? Um, okay. So the, the other part of the problem, those were the uh, we said before, those are differential equations that are homogeneous, so we can deal with them relatively easier, uh, relatively easy. The slightly more tricky part is what happens to our mz magnetization. So our mz magnetization up here, uh, the term that's inside here, uh, is not quite as straightforward to deal with because it has a Compton term, it has a term that's not directly related to mz prime. So we need a, uh, a different strategy for solving so I'm going to go ahead and write out uh, the equation that we're trying to solve. In this case, it's the mz prime dt component. And we know from the equation of motion 
just looks like minus m z prime plus m naught multiplied by z1. The question is how do we go about solving that? Well, I'm going to rearrange some things and talk about a, a general solution. So I'll, I'll collect my mz terms on the left hand side first. So I just have dmz prime dt plus mz prime. And that's going to be equal to this m naught term. So that's just by rearranging, but you might recognize this as being, oops, as being an inhomogeneous It's inhomogeneous because the right hand side is not zero. You effectively have zero in the MX component of the Y component. So what do solutions for these look like? Well, I said before, you've maybe taken differential equations more recently than me. We can identify some terms here. We have a time rate of we have a time rate of change term on the left hand side. We can say that, that left hand term looks like an x dot term, a time rate of change term. The next term, in its most general form, looks like some function of time uh, times uh, some x, uh, the mx or the z. Sorry, in this case, the mz component uh, times some function time on the right hand side. This is the most general possible. Line with components in just a second. If you can identify the, the equation that you're trying to solve has that form, and this equation does, our, our p of t function is really simple and our q of t function is really simple, uh, then there is a known solution. What we're interested in is in the solution of x of t, which is equal to 1 over u of t. I'll switch back to black in a second, I'm just highlighting the general, the general solution here. So it's 1 over u of t times the integral. And that seems all rather clumsy because we also have to say, well, what is u of t? And u of t is related to those functions we had just a second ago. So it's the exponential of the integral p of t. Goodness. Uh, this, is, this thing here is what we call an integrator. Okay, so what's, what's that all about? Well, let's start with identifying which terms actually line up uh, between the general solution and the one that we care about. So I'll move this up so we just talk about the whole problem. So let's go ahead and start with figuring out what's going on with u of t. Oh, yeah. So we're just doing sort of a one-to-one -one mapping of saying, well, what is this p of t function? What's this q of t function? Well, the p of t function is easy. This is just 1 over t1. So it's not even really a function. It's just a constant. And that's convenient because now we can evaluate u of t. And u of t is just e the integral of 1 over t1 dt. That was our definition of u of t to begin with. And that's uh, also convenient because that just looks like e to the t over t. So, so far, so good. We understand what that u of t function will look like. We come back to trying to identify what is the total solution now. So we can say, well, what is, this is the thing we're curious about, what is mz as a function of time? mz prime as a function of time. That's the solution, right? It's something we'd like to understand. Uh, and we can pick up that solution from the general solution that we have up here. And the first thing that it starts with is a 1 over u of t. And we know what that looks like. That's just e to the minus t over t is 1. Right? So this, this here is just our u of t, uh, or 1 over u. Uh, the next term that we have in there, let's use some square brackets to keep things clean. We have our u of t function itself, and that's just the integral of e, uh, in this case, positive t 
multiplied by m zero over t one t, and that is our q of t. Uh, and then we have to add this constant. So we're getting there. with some algebra to simplify uh, everything that's there on the right hand side. So let's leave the e to the minus t over t1 out of the foot. Uh, we can pull out uh, m naught here if I want to. And that is the integral of 1 over t1 e to the plus uh, t over t1. Solving that integral now, we have d e to the minus t over t1 out in front still. Uh, we have m dot still out in front. The, uh, now we can take the integral of 1 over t e to the minus t, uh, e to the t over t1. And we just have d e to the t over t1 plus potentially some constant. Roll up a little bit. Uh, we can sort of just carry through with some multiplication and combining of terms, and uh, what we'll end up with is an m naught times one plus some constant times e to the minus t over t one plus some other constant c times e to the minus t over t. And now we get stuck in this business of trying to figure out. What are, what are these constants c and c prime? So we take a, a simple example of z prime at time equals to zero. And that gives us a little leverage here. And what we end up finding is m naught times one plus c prime uh, plus a constant. Now this was by definition, this was our initial condition, right? Uh, our m z prime. So we know that whole thing has to be equal to our m z naught. And then the question is, well, what c prime and what c would allow for that to be the case? Um, you basically, on this side here, you want, you want this term here to go to 0. And you want the other term to look like an mz naught term. So to, for that to be the case, you have to have c prime And so what does that mean for us? Well, it means we can write down the final answer for mz prime as a function of time. And that's equal to m naught times 1 minus d e to the minus t over t1 plus our initial condition mz 0. So we have some different terms here that we're uh, describing. We have this first term in the front, and we have this second term on the end there. That first term represents what we call the return to equilibrium. If you look at what's happening in that term, uh, the second part of that term, the e to the minus t over t1, what happens to that term as time goes to infinity? What's e to the minus infinity? Zero, right? So that leading term, as time progresses, just becomes m naught. Right? So that's the return, that, that sort of uh, return to equilibrium, that return to the m naught condition. What about the second hand, uh, or the right hand side here? This is what we call the decay. What happens in that term as time goes to infinity? It goes to zero, right? So any so-called prepared magnetization, any mz naught, is going to decay, right? According to T1, it's going to go away. So we can we can mess around with the system with any possible series of RF pulses. We'll end up with some state of the magnetization. That state's not stable, 
it's going to decay. The so-called prepared magnetization, that second side is decaying. And all the magnetization, the pool of magnetization is returning back to the end not position, the left-hand side of that equation. So this ends up being one of the, the, the two expressions that we've worked through now, right? So let me write the, uh, the other one that we have. It's about the M. Those two expressions, I can write these as primes. Uh, these two expressions are, the, uh, are really important for us uh, in the rest of this class. They represent what happens to the bulk magnetization, uh, how does it relax during free precession. We'll talk about lots of examples where we perturb the magnetization, we act on it, we make it do something, but that's not a stable state. It's going to return to its, uh, to its uh, stable So we're going to revisit these two expressions a lot. They're fewer phenomena, as you can see. Um, I know that going through the differential equation solution stuff is a, is a bit arduous, but I want you guys to have an understanding of where this stuff comes from. Right? You won't, I won't ask you to solve these things on any exam. I might ask you to set up problems, but I'm not worried. This is, in fact, after today, it's not a class at all in differential equations. But I want you to know where that stuff comes from. Okay, questions about what we just we just did and how we got there. We basically worked through right the solution to the equation of motion when we're just talking about free precession. And free precession is really important to us. It sounds like it's just the V0 field, but a lot of MR experiments are just the V0 field. We do something with V1, turn it off, and now the system is responding to the reported information during free precession. Yeah? Um, can I just press again what's the difference between M0 and MC0? Yes. Um, and so, um, and there, there is a little bit of confusion. I might have to put a, a slide in about this uh, maybe in the next lecture. Um, but, it, but as we use it in this class, M, Z, not, this is always the initial condition. That means, what does that mean? Initial condition is the state of the magnetization after I've perturbed it. I can act on it with an RF pulse, and now I have some state of the magnetization. And that serves as the initial condition, usually, to a period of free precession. All right? I invert it, I tip it over by 90 degrees, I tip it by 2 degrees. That's the initial condition now for a period of free precession. So that's usually an initial condition for an upcoming And the distinction that we make is with regards to M0. And this is the equilibrium value of the magnetization. It's not even explicitly the MZ magnetization, right? So in one example, I can have Say this is time, and uh, I could start with some magnetization that at equilibrium has a value of zero. And so as time is progressing, it's just has a value. Of, sorry, has a value of m naught. And now I act on my magnetization with a really short RF pulse. Let's say um, let's do yeah, let's call this the m z magnetization. So this is the history, the red line shows me the history of my MZ magnetization. I haven't done anything, so it just hangs out stably at M0. Right? What happens to MZ after a 90 degree RF pulse? And let's say uh, down here this is zero magnetization. What happens to MZ after a 90 degree RF pulse? This is zero. So if I had an RF pulse here, maybe I don't care about the phase, but it's a 90 degree RF pulse. That's what's going to happen to my MZ. Where's MZ going to go after that? It's going to recover, right? So if I go back up to the expressions I have just, just above uh, here, I have two terms, right? I have, a, I have an M0 term and I have an MZ0 term. What's my MZ0 term for this example? 
zero. So that term just disappears, right? And now what's going to be described for the, the relaxation history will be described just by this first term, uh, which is an exponential recovery towards and not. So my MZ magnetization will be doing something like this. It's trying to get back to M0, right? And it can do so as a function of T1. We could, uh, just to kind of complete it, we could talk about what happens to MXY. So let's say this is MXY. What's MXY before the RF is? Zero. So it's just hanging out down here, right? What's MXY after the RF is? None. Right? Pops up all the way here, right? So in this way, the M0 magnetization is not the Z component, it's not the X component, it's not the Y component. It's the, the magnitude of the bulk magnetization vector at equilibrium how much you could possibly have. And the system always wants to get back to that state. We can put a number on that. We can, we can tell you how much we have, but that's system dependent. Uh, so we usually just have a proxy, we just call it the m not magnetization. So after a 90 pulse, uh, I have my maximum transverse magnetization. I come back to my equation for free precession, and it tells me what happens to my transverse magnetization and what happens to it. Decay is to zero. So we have an exponential term, and it's going to decay. I should write it as faster uh, than what happens with T1. T1 relaxation is pretty slow. T2 relaxation is, uh, is faster by the order of magnitude. Okay. So these equations, these first two equations, we're going to use in bunches because what happens in MR and gradient echoes and spin echoes and inversion pulses and saturation sequences is we keep going through periods of forced precession, we force the magnetization to do something, and then we let it free precess. We let it free precess so we can capture a signal, or we let it free precess so we can develop contrast. Right? You saw the action of an inversion pulse, we can null a tissue. Sometimes we want to invert it, we've got to wait. And we wait, while we're waiting, those are periods of free precession. Free precession is when you're not playing D1 pulses. Forced precession is when you are playing D1 pulses. Um, so I think I'll, I'll pop over to the slides. We've got maybe uh, just a, a couple short slides here, because uh, the next example is to talk about forced precession in the rotating frame with relaxation. So we've worked through five of the six sort of possibilities at this point, and this one goes relatively quickly because it gets so complicated that we give up. So, uh, so that's kind of fun, right? So what happens? Uh, here we have the equation of motion, right, uh, in the rotating frame with relaxation, just written out as the complete expression. Uh, sorry, it's building for some reason. Uh, we have to figure out what's our B effective. Our B effective is this fictitious field plus the B field that's applied in the rotating frame. We know what that fictitious field looks like. It's just always the B0 field, so we just kind of deal with that one easily. The B field in the rotating frame, that's a little bit more complicated. It depends on the example we're considering, and here we're considering forced precession. So, we, so the applied B field during forced precession is still the B0 field, because the B0 field is always on. But now we add a B1 field. The B1 field that we care about in the rotating frame is just the B1 envelope part of that function. And I've written it out in a slightly more complicated form here, where we potentially have a cosine and a sine component, because now it includes the phase of the RF. Right? If you think of the simple example of the phase being zero, uh, theta is zero, and you just recover what we've been using up to this point, which is just the V1 envelope function as a function of time along the i hat time direction. The sine zero term disappears. So that's one way back to what we were already working with. Um, combining B rote with the fictitious field, then you end up with a slightly, uh, not terribly complicated, but a slightly more complicated B effective field. More complicated than uh, free precession, right? What was B effective for free precession? Zero, right? And that's the example we just worked through, and that was part of that. So what happens here? Um, we end up with our equation of motion that we need to solve. Uh, this is wrong. <laughs> Sorry. There should be a B effective and a gamma term that shows up in the, in the front there, right? So I'll have to fix that later. So uh, I'll show you quickly what this looks like. It's really just the setup, um, because uh, you'll see that it is in fact relatively complicated system of equations and we're not going to uh, work on uh, actual solutions to that set. Alright, so what does that look like? 
<coughs> so we have the uh, oops, let's keep that uh, we have the uh, the equation of motion, which is just dm rho dt is equal to. Remember this business, right? The i hat prime, j hat prime, k hat prime. This helps us deal with that precessional term. prime because you know, all those components. Now the B field is what gets a little bit more complicated here. We have the B1 envelope is a function of time plus data. And the second term is similar but a sine term. So we have the B1 envelope uh, as a function of time sine data. And then what was our uh, Z component of our B field? Uh, what complicates things, of course, is we're concerned about relaxation. So we have an mx prime on the i hat prime direction plus an m y prime, the j hat prime direction. And those are the t2 relaxing components. And the last thing we have is what's happening with z. So that's our m z prime minus our m not component. It's acting well on the k hat prime direction. So that's just the setup. That's the what is the equation of motion with relaxation for force precession. Um, the, the K term that shows up right here is uninteresting because in the rotating frame that term effectively disappears. B1, uh, for better or for worse, got a little bit complicated. So all I'm going to do is just convince you one more time that we can set this up the right way by writing out what is what is the actual system of equations that concern us. And so we end up with a DMX prime. And we have to, again, work on these cross products, right, uh, to figure out what is happening on the I uh, direction, if you will. So, uh, and so that just looks like uh, N, Y, prime, Y to zero, there's a zero term there, minus N, Z, prime, times B1, envelope function. Direction. That's the processional business. And then we have to add the relaxation business, which is like the next prime of T2. Also so I'm just carrying out what happens with this uh, the processional cross product business that's in the front. So then we have to do the next one is this guy. So we write out our D and uh, Y prime T2. Minus sign, it's m x prime dot to zero, so that's going to obviously go away. M z prime times our b one envelope function again. This time it's a function of cosine theta, and that acts on the j hat prime direction. And again, we need our relaxation term, so we have m y prime by t two on the j hat prime direction. You can already see trouble brewing. Right out the last one, which is DMZ prime dt. So it's equal to, uh, in this case, an MX prime times our B1 envelope function again. Sine theta. Uh, minus, in this case, an MY prime uh, again times our B1 envelope function cosine uh, theta term. That's acting on the K hat prime direction, right? And we still have to add in that last term, which is uh, the relaxation along the k direction, which is mz prime minus m naught. Oops. All by t1. Uh, again, on the k prime direction. So, so what's the point? Well, if we look at this again carefully, we'll see the complexity, right? This is, we're talking about the time rate of change of the x prime component. Depends on the y prime component and the z prime component and the x prime component. And so, you know, for better or for worse, you have a complicated set of coupled differential equations. Which is to say, if you're interested in understanding what happens uh, in the rotating frame during forced precession, and you care about relaxation, it's complicated. Right? Simulation can handle it. It's actually not that big of a deal. This is not exceedingly. Set of, set of uh, equations. 
but simple solutions by hand, we don't have them, right? We don't have analytic solutions. And so at this point, we're not going to, um, we won't be revisiting, uh, sort of working through these systems of equations to get uh, the system of, of sort of independent equations, if you will, and then their solutions. We work through most of the examples that we can. The setup here was just to show you that it gets complicated, and in fact, it's complicated enough that we don't worry about it. We don't, we don't deal with analytic solutions because we can't. Um, the question now might be, well, but is that an important condition? Do we care about that condition? Don't we, don't we really need to look at it more carefully? And if it isn't an important condition, why? And then what are the conditions that we do care about? I think that takes us back to the slides for a second. So, so what about force perception in the rotating frame with relaxation? There's three sort of key things there, right? And we've looked at every combination. We've looked at uh, force from free, we've looked at rotating in the lab, and we've looked at with and without relaxation. So there's six different sort of conditions that you should be working your way through being comfortable with, understanding or the, back, the, the meaning of those words. So do we care about force perception in the rotating frame with relaxation? We care about the rotating frame because that arguably simplifies things for us. Uh, do we care about force perception and relaxation at the same time? Well, our pulses are short, right? Our pulses are 100 microseconds, maybe 5 milliseconds. That's a pretty short time scale relative to the relaxation time constants, which are long, hundreds of milliseconds for T1, maybe thousands of milliseconds or even hundreds of milliseconds for T2. The point being, our pulses are really short, much shorter than, say, relaxation events in general. So uh, what does that mean? Well, it means that we don't actually care too often about the combination of force procession and relaxation. There's not that much relaxation during an RF pulse. Right? Those, time, those time scales are different by order of magnitude or two or even three. Um, and then we saw it in the equation that the coupling is complicated really best suited for simulation. Now, you can't rule it out entirely. It depends on the project that you're working on, the research problem that you care about. And then when it comes to simulation, it's actually just not that big of a deal to throw it in. Uh, but when we work on problems by hand, it's too hard. OK. So what do we care about? We've talked about free. We've talked about force. We've talked about relaxation. And we've considered all combinations at this point, setting up the system of equations, looking at solutions when we can uh, of all of those, right? What are the ones that actually concern us in this class? It's really free procession in the rotating frame with relaxation. Okay, so free procession, just B0, rotating frame, getting in with the spin system, and with relaxation. So after we've acted on the spin system, it's going to be freely precessing, relaxing back to equilibrium. And that's when we're either developing contrast, waiting for a particular contrast, or we're capturing a signal capture signals during free precession. Or we care about forced precession in the rotating frame, but we ignore the effects of relaxation at that point. If we're forcing the spin system to do something, we need to tip it by 90, we need to flip it over with a focusing pulse, we want to do something else, that's fine. That's a forced precession, it's a short event, and we don't care about relaxation. So these end up being the two main conditions that we care about. Uh, and then of course we can see um, so this brings us into, I want to talk quickly about some MATLAB stuff and then just open it up for uh, questions and remarkably we're at the end of the hour. Um, so I won't spend too much time on this because I, I showed it to you already. Uh, this is the block equations, rotating frame, free procession. This is what the uh, expressions themselves actually look like. Uh, I'm going to back out of this for a second and just get to uh, maybe this. So uh, skipping ahead just a second, I said last time, we're going to use operators in this class, right? Matrix operators are going to act on the magnetization to produce a new state of magnetization. This is the whole reason, this slide right here is the whole reason that we have to use this 4x4 four four representation. Uh, the 4x4 four four representation lets us account for all of the effects of relaxation. We have two T2 effects on MX, we have T2 effects on MY. We have T1 effects on MZ, but this 4x4 four four representation lets us account for the decay magnetization plus the return to equilibrium 
And that might not be obvious sort of mathematically, but if you work it out, this matrix operator that I'm showing you here will give you that system of equations, right? And the whole business of using this four by four matrix operator is because of this M naught term. It ends up making the simulation framework a lot easier because we just do everything with matrix multiplication. If we didn't deal with it in this four by four framework, you would do a matrix operation and then you'd have to add on this return to equilibrium term. And then a matrix operation and add on this term. This just is a convenient way of doing the same thing, of doing both the matrix operator and adding on the return to equilibrium case. So don't, don't, don't let it confuse you too much. It's, a, it's really a matter of convenience more than anything. Um, there's some advantages and disadvantages here. Uh, I won't go through that right now. Um, and then I think we saw these before. We saw what the four by four operator looks like for precession uh, in the last lecture. We talked about what it looks like for an R operator. Again, kind of complicated. It has the flip angle. It has the phase in it. But if you know your flip angle, you know your phase, that's giving you the code to generate the operator to act on your bulk magnetization. Part of what you're going to do in the homework, so this gets us into the homework discussion a little bit, is show me how the, the bulk magnetization develops, how it changes as a function of time, using these kinds of operators. And to do so, you'll have to have small increments in alpha. You want to tip over by a small amount, right, to show me the path that the magnetization actually takes, not just that it goes from equilibrium boom to in the transverse plane. Okay? Um, don't let theta throw you off, right? Are you are you going to increment theta? No, right. Theta is just a, is a coordinate system description. It's telling you, am I going to tip it over this way, or am I going to tip it over that way? But the theta of the RF pulse just describes the, the, the uh, coordinate system. It's not incremented uh, during the, the RF uh, event. Um, and then this we saw already is the, is the relaxation. OK, so again, sorry we're bumping up against the hour here. Uh, I'm happy to take questions about the homework or hang out for a little bit uh, to address that. I don't have anything prepared for that, but if you guys have questions,